I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI and Traction Conf. Today's webinar is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy, RBC, in partnership with Founder Institute, Lazarus Institute, and BCF Ventures. Super stoked today because not only we have a great investor in the house, but she's like me, a native Torontonian, but living in the Bay Area. She invests in both US and Canadian companies. Super smart. You have your PhD, right? I have my PhD. And after what we've read from Wall Street Journal this weekend, I had to put doctor in front of my Twitter handle. <laughs> and then uh, on, on the investing front, you focus on health and bio, AI, ML, and social platforms. And moreover, you talk a lot about network, network effects, right? Network effects. Yeah. Yeah. We talked a lot about network effects. I think, you know, over, over the years, um, we've gravitated towards companies that leverage network effects in their business or have potential to have them because it's how we evaluate defensibility. And for those of you do, who don't know what network effects are, um, network effects exist when products, uh, the value of a product improves with more people who use the product or with more, with more data that we collect, right? So in the Boast AI case, when you think about any kind of machine learning or AI, you're definitely gonna see network effects on the data side. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to marketplaces and social networks, you're probably gonna see network effects because they're created by people, right? So whether it's Uber or DoorDash or Facebook, um, the value of these platforms are only, uh, I mean, these the, the platforms are only as valuable as the people who are using it. Definitely. And then it ties very nicely into, into the startup you did, Insight Data Science, uh, which was a YC-backed company. Yeah. And you were connecting startups with data scientists. Tell us about that. How did you get into that and then move on to investing? Yeah. Um, it's funny. I think, I think most people who arrive in Silicon Valley, um, just like they, they kind of just stumble and fall into opportunities very serendipitously. Um, so you, you made the nod from Toronto. I came from Toronto. I had just finished my PhD in engineering, but not software development, just, you know, operations research, financial engineering. And it was 2012. So not a lot of people were looking for engineers like me. I could code, but not in production. Like I was in, I was using MATLAB, um, but people wanted, you know, Python coders. Um, so having said that, uh, I was hanging out like most people do at a barbecue with fellow Canadians. And I met who would be the, I guess my co-founder who had this idea to create data, insight data science. And the idea here was let's take top PhDs, train them in STEM, train them to be data scientists, then place them at companies like Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, Twitter. And this is what but this was when big data was all the rage and companies were trying to figure out how do we harness or glean insights from all this information that we're collecting without taking away from our engineers who need to build product, but might have an affinity for math. So we thought, well, why don't we find people who are good at math and can code and just retrofit them for industry? And so that's what we did. So I did this for about a year and a half. Um, I learned so much, but decided it was just time to move on. I think I'm a way better investor, I guess. Um, than I am an operator. I think that operating life is really, really difficult. And unless you're super passionate about the cause that you're building, it's, 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 really, it's really hard to prioritize doing that for the rest of your life. Definitely. I, you know, there was a quote, I think the first traction we ran from Jeff Lawson at the end was have conviction about the customer you're serving and the comp product you're building and let that be your guide. And if you can't have that, don't build a company. Right, right. And I think um, someone just pointed me to um, Paul Graham's new, one of Paul Graham's newest essays on earn, earnestness. And yeah. he talks about the, like having a genuine interest in what you're building. Like this is the most powerful motivator that you can have, right? And yeah. what drives um, us to build big things. So I think, I think for me, um, and I learned this actually as a, as a kid, I always... I always envied people who knew that they wanted to be like knew what they wanted to do when they grew up. Right. And I'm sure like your wife, we were just talking about her being a physician. I'm sure she knew at some point, like, Oh, I'm going to go be a doctor. Right. And I saw this with my brother and I saw this with my friends, but I never knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. Right. All I knew was, I think my skill set is in helping people realize their dreams. And so I think that's, that's what 
attracted me to venture. And I didn't even think about, oh, is venture a good fit for me? I just kind of got lucky again, you know, through the Canadian network, met my current partner, Boris Wirtz, who had just raised version one's first fund. We're now in our third fund. And um, Boris took a chance and said, hey, why don't you come and learn venture and invest with me? I think one of the best skills outside of, you know, people skills and, and the relationships and, and the desire to give and support people, help them is data science. And like you have mm -hmm. that perfect combination and that will help you not only invest in winning companies, but also help them succeed because you have that innate desire uh, to help people. And then you said one of the most exciting things you've done during COVID is you started weightlifting. Weightlifting, yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's some, some, something in me and as a kid, I wanted to be an Olympic weightlifter. No, um, you know, I, I think this was not probably very surprising because I wanted to, to, to figure out how I could stay fit during, during COVID and the gym that I am a part of is just across the street. And I just saw these people lifting and I just thought I want to be strong. But what's amazing about weightlifting for me is it's made me even more competitive, which has translated so positively in work, right? I think a lot of people, or maybe not a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but it, it, it might not be known to many that venture is very, very competitive, right? Because when you think about a given year, there's probably only, I don't know, three to four unicorns or maybe at most 10 unicorns that would come from like the graduating class of 2020. Boast will be one of them, right? And so you. when you think about when you think about all these venture funds that want to buy the right to these companies, you can think about all this competition, right? So I think I think that uh, the, that the weightlifting has definitely fueled my competitive nature because every week I'm trying to think about how do I prepare myself to hit a new PR? Like what are the different inputs, sleep, food, lack of stress, et cetera, that can help me perform better? Yeah, and, and stress sort of like, I guess, work or progressive overload is the fundamental to growing, right? You add a little bit week over right. week. It, it compounds because especially during COVID, people are mentally stressed out. There's so much going on and, and having a healthy body is a way to a healthy mind. Our team has started this co-fit challenge. So they work out on Zoom together every day. Somebody recommends a new workout of the day and they do it. Uh, but yeah, what, is, what is the what is the workout that you've been recommending? I, you know what, I, it's usually like four sets of 10 burpees, 10 push-ups sit-ups, et cetera, something simple. So like everyone can, can do it um, on in a group setting, right? Across work, because if, if you make it too challenging, people just drop off. Ex yeah, exactly. Exactly. But the concept of progressive overload also mm -hmm. applies to companies, right? I mean, if mm -hmm. you look at like Uber, Airbnb, they all start in like distressed times. And we had the author of Blitzscaling last week, Chris Ye, and he was talking about like stress and uh, trying to grow out of it in a compressed time. So let's let's dive right okay. into it. If you were to start a company today, how would you build your team? And perhaps, you know, sharing stories of entrepreneurs you met would be a good way. Like, you know, who are the first few people you'd bring maybe to get the product market fit? And then how do you get them to seed series B? Like, walk us through how you think about that. Yeah, there's a lot there. I think there's a lot to it. I'm going to take the investor perspective, right? Because I'm not a builder. So when we're evaluating any kind of company, we're taking inventory of their strength as it pertains to two things, right? Because we talk a lot about product market fit. So obviously the two things we want to think about are product and market, but obviously the founder piece as well. The founder piece is really related to the skill sets um, when it comes to product and market. So, you know, take inventory of your strengths and, and try to figure out where, you're, where you might be deficient, right? So on the product side, when I think about product, I think about all the tech, the things that happen on the technical side, back end, front end design. When I think about market, right, I think more about sales, whether it's like BD marketing, etc. Right. So as, as I think about starting a company today, coming back to take an inventory of your strength, and then figure out where where to complement your skill set. Right. What we typically see in a co-founding team is a you know, technical co-founder and a non-technical co-founder, right? So one, one that's driving the product vision and then the other one that's figuring out how to tell an incredible story. When you, uh, when you look at like the right time to build leaders or, or hire leadership versus individual contributors. So I find myself like I have become like the super individual contributor, didn't realize we're going to raise this series A and now I feel like 
how do I level up into a leader and not continue being an individual contributor? So like, do you, do you see this problem with your mm-hmm. companies where like, you know, they've raised the seed round, they're like a super IC, like how do you advise them to like, you know, force them to hire the right leaders and in what sequence really? Like the leaders, like you yourself as a leader is an IC. Yeah. And, and yeah. we're hiring out for those things, right? Yeah. It's, um, I think there's, there's kind of like two parts to this, but for, for those, it's funny, most of the CEOs that we work with, when I think about ICs, I mostly think about um, founders with technical capabilities. So in our portfolio, we have a few, a handful of CEOs that are actually in charge of code, right? They're the engineering person. They're like the CEO and the CTO. And in that case, we definitely push them to find, you know, a CTO or just someone to take the brunt of the, the coding piece so that they can do the management. But for the most part, I would say not a lot of people are actually like you, Lloyd, who, who are probably feeling more icy. They're probably coming at this way more as a manager, right? Um, but having said that, I think what's very common in startup land is that the first couple of hires you bring on are typically like Swiss army knives, right? And you want that because you want to find people who are hardworking, they're passionate about the vision, and they know how to collaborate around, like across different uh, team functionalities, right? And so the other thing with Swiss Army Knives is like in the early days when you're hiring, you often, you often think you know what you need. And so you create these job descriptions, then you hire, then you put someone in that role and then you realize the roles morph. So having a Swiss Army Knife is helpful because then you can be flexible and uh, you know, change function when necessary. But of course, as you progress, Swiss Army Knives with breath don't necessarily scale with your company. And so this probably goes back to your IC question. Um, if you're lucky, these knives, right, find their niche and start to specialize and, and grow with the company. But, but it's not abnormal that companies, you know, need to level up in their talent and bring on more experienced leaders with more, you know, specialized skill sets. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not inevitable that you're going to, that most companies see a future where they t- turn over their talent quite often. Definitely. And, and the, something I'm going through, I think a lot of people here are going through is like, what is that sequence? Let's say you have a company that's just raised a seed round because you guys invest all the way from like seed through beyond. Right. And um, mm-hmm. what, so I consider myself that Swiss army knife, maybe I, I call it I, I, individual contributor, but let's say you've got like your, solid developer, solid operations person, um, like, you know, basically a CTO and a CTO and a business person. At one po- what point do you start thinking, like, I got to break this up and what comes first, right? Yeah. I, like, where do you, where do you see this? Or is it all over the map? Like, it's, you- all, it's kind of like all, it's kind of all over a map, right? Like, so when we invest in the company and I had mentioned this, like, we want to find a founding team with like two elements, like this technical excellence and storytelling and storytelling magic, right? Yeah. So you can hire based in two phases and categories then, like what skill set do we need that we don't already have? And then if we have those skills, like number two, what skill set do we have, but we can be better for scale, right? And so by, I think as you build your team, you, you hope that by the time you get to series B, you filled in as many holes as possible and that you're now in the position of leveling up your talent. In the early days, breadth with Swiss army knives probably serve you way better um, than, than the specialization. However, like if you are a, I mean, you know, there's gonna be certain roles that you're gonna want that like superstar, amazing, like growth of like product growth who probably ran like all of Uber as an example on your team, if you're building a marketplace or like, the AI guru to be on both team, right? right? Because that's so critical to the go-to-market or the or the product experience. Definitely, no makes uh, makes sense. I want to move into like uh, comp structures as you as you go in, and you probably have a lot of data on this. Like at a at a at a seed stage versus Series A stage versus Series B stage. Um, how should one think? And I, I won't dive super super deep into all these other roles, but specifically the main ones, right? Like CTO, head of product, sure. sales, and uh, head, of, uh, head of marketing, head of growth kind of thing. There's like four things. Four, yeah. Three or four things. Yeah, I think at the, 
at the very, there's probably a couple of guidelines and there's a lot of comp tables that you can, yeah. that anyone can refer to, but it's the question, the age old question is like, how do I balance salary and equity? Right. But yeah. I think there's certain frameworks to think about, which is um, you always want to kind of lead by example. So as a founder, if you're the founder, like you, if, if you, ex if you want people to take equity over salary, then you got to set the example and probably not pay yourself like $200,000. Right. <laughs> Um, that's kind of like the first and foremost thing, right? And so a lot of our founders actually, like we have one portfolio company that's filled with, um, it's completely technical team. And they've just decided like our salary, like our salary and our equity across the entire company on the technical side is going to be the exact same, right? So there's no question around equity or salary. And I think that's, that, that's, that sets the bar, um, that doesn't work for everyone, especially if you have then a sales organization, right? Um, I don't like a lot of sales teams or like the non-technical teams aren't given a lot of equity and they're compensated usually with bonuses on performance, right? Like how, how quickly they can build the pipeline, how many sales they can have. There are guidelines that you can all look up, right? Um, I don't even have them off the top of my head, but let's say for the sake of argument, I think an average engineer in the Bay area, just starting out is going to be like 150 or 120,000 with like 0.25% equity, right? If you're like the first to 10th employee. Right. Uh, yeah. And then how does that change at series A? Just, just going off that same one example. Uh, I think it, yeah. It's, it's probably a little bit, it, I think it, it, by the series, by series A, you're going to have a little bit more of like bifurcation around skill set, Right. So so, so, whereas I feel like at seed, we, we have seen on the engineering side, I'm just going to talk about engineering. Um, everyone is kind of like the same. You're not hiring like junior engineers. Everyone's just hiring like a senior engineer Yeah. versus like, once you get into series A and there's more of like a hierarchy, right. Where, where the, where the organization is not completely flat, then you're going to have probably more junior people. And then also like more senior people. And therefore the, the equity bands are going to be a little bit wider. Right. So a junior engineer might start with like 1.15, right. And a, and a, and if you, let's say, were to bring in a CTO later in the game, that person might get between like five to 10%, right? Wow. So you're yeah. saying if a CTO, you brought in a CTO later in the game or earlier in the game? So like- at, at Later, like earlier or later, right? Like we've seen, we've seen this both, right? Like if you have, we, we, I've seen a CMO come on for anywhere between like uh, three to 5%, right? Because the company realized to get to that next level, we're going to have to make this investment. Right. And it's a great way to incentivize people to work more for more than just their salary. Like they're, they're, you're, they're investing in themselves and the upside. I think it depends on like when someone comes into the picture, like how much of the product is built and how much innovation still needs to happen. Right. Like not to say that there's not a lot of innovation from like, obviously from like series A onward, but it's just how much of that infrastructure is already built. How critical is this person? to the team. I think that's how people, that's how anyone should evaluate equity percentages is how critical is this person to, to the upside of your company. Definitely. Now, David asks here, what, what do you think of incentive or merit-based vesting versus time-based? So a hybrid of time and performance. Um, I haven't seen it on merit. Um, so that's a new, that's a new thing for me. Um, but I'm going to make that an, I'm going to make a note and add that to the, the startup guide. To yeah, think about that. yeah. And we'll share out the startup guide with the recording after, um, any, so Lauren asks here, what should be the right level of commission for sales reps and, uh, and leadership, like percentage fixed versus variable comp kind of thing. General thing in talking, cause I know a lot of sales leaders and we did a lot of research is what we see is that basically somebody wants to make double, they need to make double their base on OTE. And typically like if, if it's a hundred K base, then it's 200 OTE. And uh, as mm. you get serious um, sales leaders are making uh, anywhere from three to 500 K OTE at, the, at like a series A company. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, yeah. To your point, it's, it just, it just varies so much, right? Like that, that percentage fix just, it, it's going to depend on just like how senior this person is, how much you want to win them over. But yeah, to your point, I think the last one I saw was at like 500 for like a series for a ser one of our series A companies. We tried to win this person over 
And that um, was 500 fixed or like a, OT. Uh, OT, yeah. A 250 base, yeah. So it's probably to your to exactly what you said, one to two. One to two, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Now let's, let's, you know, the, the harder part, we can sit and dream that we need all these awesome people, <laughs> but the harder part is actually hiring these people. And so, you know, you, you wrote this great section on key steps to successful hiring in your startup handbook. Uh, tell us more about that. Like, what are the key steps to hire? How do you source candidates? What are some hacks? Scoring yeah. Here? I mean, key, key steps to successful hiring, right. Obviously means you want to have a great pipeline of ca- t- talent and you want a great filter, right? It's not very different from investing when I think about it, right? Like in order to be a great investor, I got to see a lot of deals and I got to be a good picker, right? So we can, we can, we can break it up in those two categories. Um, so on the sourcing side, I mean, there's, I don't think there's a, a hack per se, right? But when you think about sourcing your candidates, you can look within your own network. And of course, like for the people you've already hired, look at their networks. You should also leverage your investors' networks. Um, I find that a lot of our portfolio companies have just found great success in being proactive on LinkedIn and even Twitter. Um, AngelList has been a very good source too because people, like if you post a job description there, people are actually looking to work for a startup. So you don't have to have that awkward conversation of like, hey, you should join us instead of Google, right? Um, I, I would also look at places where people with the same mindset of, as you hang out, whatever that means in a COVID world, right? So if, for example, you're a developer and you're building an open source tool, then like maybe, maybe look, maybe source on GitHub as an example. Um, other places to source, uh, we've seen this with one of our portfolio companies recently is they hire away their customers. Um, they meet someone that is just in love with their product and then hire them away from their, their actual customer, which I think is a, is a nice hack. Then you don't have to sell yourself too much. Um, and then of course you can bring on recruiters for more specialized talent. So that's, that's how I think about sourcing. Um, in terms of hacks, uh, other hacks on picking, et cetera, um, Keith Rebois famously has this like setting, if you're gonna, or saying that if you're gonna succeed at, at a startup, you have to, be able to find and hire undiscovered talent, right? So this probably goes back to sourcing. Um, so undiscovered talent are people that like are, are super special and very underrated because as a startup, it's actually really hard to recruit people who are proven. So where is that special pool of talent that no one else knows of that you might know of, right? It could be your alma mater um, if it's the University of Toronto as an example of where we come from. Um, yeah. And then I think the other, not, again, not a hack, but if you, if you're raising money, I think, um, and this comes back to the, to, to Lloyd talking about ICs, but we have to realize that like your job as a CEO, after you raise capital is probably spending 80% of your time hiring. Right. So in order to be successful at hiring, you got to make sure that the process that you're running is as efficient, as streamlined and as productive as possible. Right. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that, whether it's, you know, automating emails, like figuring out scheduling, how do you share interviewer notes, having consistency across all these interviewers, right? The fact that you're spending 80% of your time hiring means that this is where you should make sure that this is as productive and efficient as possible. Definitely. So speaking of that, like what are some tools of the trade you recommend? Because I mean, as a founding team's job effectively is recruiting now, now I'm finding that too, right? Like is, is very important to make sure you bring the right people, evangelize them because there's a lot of competition too. Yeah. I mean, on the, on the, um, I don't even know if Lever has an ETS um, applicant tracking system, but I just, I always think like, just don't, don't worry too much about like crazy software as it is just like, you know, even if you had a, a a solid air table to track your talent, that's probably good enough. Right. But just piece together, like the automation, like when I say automating, automating emails, maybe it doesn't mean automation, but it means like as a CEO, you don't have to draft every email. You can hire like an assistant to help you with that and to figure out the scheduling, but write it as though it's you. So it, it appears more personal, right? just figuring out how best to use your time. Um, these are the kind of like little hacks to make sure that when you are spending time with the candidates, like, or when you're spending time on hiring, it's primarily on spending time with the candidates. 
Yeah, I think we're, we're currently looking for an ATS, but in, in, <laughs> the, absence, in the absence of that, uh, one of the things I've used, because I source pretty much all the 90% of the traction speakers over the years, and it all started with cold emailing. And so you have been using Mixmax, which is like you, you have a personalized script, uh, you know, and, and you can send like hundreds of emails that go from your Gmail and then it auto responds like real humans kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And, you know, some people are okay. You, you, we had this whole conversation about Calen, Calendly, Cal Calendly. Yeah. and how everyone pre COVID did not like it. Cause they thought, Oh, it's so impersonal. And now everyone's like, okay, yeah, we get it. Right. So um, I think there is something to be said about uh, personalizing or appearing to personalize your emails when you're trying to recruit because candidates are always looking to feel special. Exactly. And so like yeah. these tools let you personalize at scale because then you can go in and, and maybe have uh, an EA or a, or a junior person look up their LinkedIn's and write something special, much like sales development teams. It's, it's a yeah. sales job, hiring yeah. is a sales job, right? Like personalize so, something. Exactly. Something, you know. We had one, so one portfolio company of ours um, is called Outreach. Um, and when we invested many years ago, 20, 2012 was when we made the first investment, they were building um, a dev marketplace, kind of like hired, right? Called group talent at the time. And that was one of the biggest challenges was like sourcing talent, like finding these engineers that they could then eventually kind of package, kind of like insight to these, to these people in the market who would be looking for them. So they didn't um, even start as an outbound sales outreach tool. No, no. But what they did when they, when they had trouble with traction on the marketplace was they said they looked at the tools that they built and they built this, this outbound automated email system, which then they, which they then spun out as outreach. And outreach is like our first unicorn, right? Like they are, they're, it's, they're, awesome. it's all about sales automation. So it's funny that you mentioned that because hiring is hundred percent sales, very similar kind of flow. And they're the pioneers in the space and everyone else came after that. And that's, that's amazing. How early did you invest in them? We, like, so we invested in group talent, right? The marketplace. So the company completely pivoted based yeah. on, um, you know, how well they did. We, we have another portfolio company uh, called Ada Support, Toronto company. Same thing, right? So they were building a social network, a mobile Quora, right? In 2014. You, and that's I know Mike you, Murchison's company, right? Yeah, Mike Murchison's company, right? Like he pitched that traction in 2015. Yeah, with, yeah. With the, with the so, Quora. right, right. So everyone here is probably like, "Oh, Ange, like, how could you invest in a mobile Quora? Like, you're, you're, how could you do that in 2014?" And we're like, "Well, you know, they had great traction in Toronto, but it was hard to scale." So when it so we look back and we're like, okay, well, what should we do now, right? Like we still have 200, we have half the capital in the bank for this pre-seed round. Like, let's, let's think about a pivot. So what did they do? They looked at the, the one tool that was like crazy helpful for them and they spun that out, which was around customer support, right? Because everyone would ping them about their product experience and a lot of the questions they could have answered, like if, if people just read like the, the manual, right? But didn't. And yeah. so they created this automated bot that could just answer questions for you. And now Ada's, you know, Ada just raised their series B at the beginning of just before COVID by Excel, a series B, but this started as a, you know, social network that didn't find any scale and then spun out in the same way as group talent did. That's what, when you, when you go, you get, you know, you typically get asked a lot of these canned questions on, did you think you were going to be here when you started? And I guarantee you, like most people, very few people I can say are today what they what they started with. Yeah. Uh, maybe Jeff Lawson was that because when I spoke to him in 2013 or 14, he said, I want to, I want Twilio is going to be the AWS for telecom. Like he's yeah. probably one of the rare people. Who got it right. <laughs> Who got it right. <laughs> got it yeah. right. Exactly. Um, and I, I think, I think this, I think this just goes to show, right? Like the importance of, you know, the, what we call like kind of, uh, like founder quality, right? Because the one things can change all the time. And even as you're thinking about building your team, right? You know, people like th the direction that you're going to go as a team is going to change, right? But hopefully their characters, their skill set, like all that is going to stay constant, right? And that they're just a matter of finding a better founder market match. Definitely. Founder product market match, right? Founder product market match. Market I match like yeah. It. The founders were always great, right? Like we, we knew that to begin with, but it just didn't match the product in the market just wasn't res as responsive. And as we probably all know, like they always say like, oh, the market always wins. Doesn't matter how amazing your founders are. But when you find that amazing combination of an incredible founder and, an, and a big market, 
magic happens. Definitely. And definitely. I think, I think some of your companies have found that, especially outreach. I did not know that story. And that's a, that's a very. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a very, it's a, it was, it was at the point and Boris and I, my partner, we just kind of talked through all the companies yesterday. And we always remind ourselves how uh, Manny, the founder literally had three weeks of cash in the bank. That was it. And um, we, we wrote a small bridge for, for this, you know, this pivot and he was off to the races. So we got lucky. That's, that's amazing. But we believed in him. So, <laughs> so c- coming to, uh, I want to close out on the hiring uh, front here. Is there, uh, is there some scoring rubrics that you recommend, or maybe we can link to it after like, yeah. You- yeah. I think, I think what I've seen with our portfolio companies, like there's obviously lots of, lots of creative ideas here, right? And you don't have to re- really reinvent the wheel. But I think there's two things to really consider. One, like, do you consider all votes equal on your team, right? And, and that's something for you guys to figure out. Um, you know, should a salesperson qualify, you know, a technical person's capability, right? Probably not, but they might have something, a, a, a good word on, their, on whether it's a cultural fit, right? and vice versa. So I think the first thing to consider is like, should you treat all kind of votes equal, who has veto, et cetera. And then I think the second thing that we've seen is um, when voting, don't allow for neutral responses, if that makes sense, right? Like not, don't, don't, it's either like a strong hire, hire, don't hire, but none of the maybes, because I think that's not, that that doesn't really promote good discussion. And it, it probably doesn't, translate to um like I, I just think you're going to have a lot of um it's not it's not going to be a good discussion on whether or not this person's a fit if it's just like well i'm not 100 percent sure yeah so it's either it's either yay or nay no in between and i see a yeah. lot of pitch events have started doing that no threes it's either one it's either like a five or it's a it's a one or it's a one yeah no threes <laughs> oh, no, no maybes <laughs> if people actually don't have an opinion, then you just don't count them, right? Like you just completely remove them from the equation, but then you have to figure out, well, how many strong hires do I need, right? Um, but the, the question on scoring and, and voting is, is something that we even think about as VCs, like not in a small partnership, but if you hear about like the Sequoias and the Andreessen's, everyone tries to figure out what's the best way when you have to manage like nine different GPs as an example. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's the biggest board you're part of? We'll get into board after like a few questions. The biggest board that I'm part of, I mean, mo- like most of what right now I would say, we don't, we as a small fund don't enforce being on a board, right? We like to have as much formality that a board has, that a board can provide like at the seed stage, but we don't ever enforce it. But we think they're good best practices. Um, the biggest board, I mean, at the seed series A, it's probably like five people, right? Two founders, maybe an independent, two investors. Um, the biggest, biggest one at like a series C, and it's not even clear how many of them are board members versus board observers versus guests. But like I've seen board, board meetings where there's like 20 people in there and it's just like too many, too many cooks in the kitchen. Damn. That yeah. Is, that, is, that, is, uh, that is crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. Um, not all of them have voting rights, right? But it's just when you have so many people there and they're just yapping away, it's hard to, it, it, it doesn't make, it doesn't move the conversation very quickly. <laughs> Definitely. Um, how do you ensure you hire fast without breaking the culture? I mean, uh, you talked about like, you know, all these uh, tactics to hire and attract talent, but how do you, you know, when you raise money, you want to hire really fast. What are some key things, actions that would break it? You know, I think that there has to be then be an element of culture that you're assessing in the interview, right? And you have to value that as much as you would a skill, right? Um, and, and we had just talked about that. Um, but things that would break it culture-wise, um, I, think, I think the challenges that we've seen are, are maybe two or threefold. I think one, when the the values of the company or the vision is just not really clear. So that results in people not really knowing what they're working towards or when you're not really setting, and and then therefore you're not able to set like clear OKRs. I think the second piece is around like politics and unfair treatment, right? When when people are being promoted or they get special 
treatment because of their, their status or whatever relationship they have with their, their superior person, like their, their manager, as an example. So I don't think this is anything rocket science, but um, the, the, the best people to protect the current culture are the, the people who are working in the company. So we should use that as a, if there's a way to assess out that element in an interview, I think it's important. During COVID times, how are your teams doing? Like, what are some things they've been doing to manage through the pandemic? Because like so much uncertainty and now things seem to be picking up again. I think what there's, there's some portfolio companies that have done this super, super well. Um, Ada support, I'll go back to, um, to, to Mike here. They've, what they've tried to do is just, they, they have a head of people and her job is just to make sure, well, not her only job, but making sure that everyone's having a good time and, and still finding ways in which they can serendipitously uh, encounter one another, right? Like, cause I think one of the biggest challenges in COVID is that um, the, the creativity can be lost, right? When you don't have water cooler talk anymore, right? So some of our portfolio companies have set up kind of like, I don't know if they use Zoom, but kind of open-ended, like come in, say hi to your friends and leave, right? Lunches and stuff. They've also done a lot of like group activities where they have like virtual potlucks um, or like food competitions. Um, they've done like, I, I'm just thinking about some of the things that Ada has done um, so that you feel that everyone's on the same team. Just wear blue on Mondays or blue on Tuesdays. Um, they've, they've even taken time off and just to say like Fridays, Fridays you can work on whatever you want or just don't come to work, right? But I think the key is to have that the, the companies that have done well in the remote setting have all been empathetic, right? Towards the fact that like everyone has challenges working at home and so are therefore more flexible on time. And then they also try to create new experiences to foster culture and community and trust because you can't just take a holiday party that you would have had before and just bring it online. That just doesn't work. So you got to come up with creative ways to do that. I guess going into 2021, what are the biggest fears you're seeing your portfolio companies have as leaders? I mean, I think, I think the only, you know, if portfolio companies, if you're, if you're a strong founder, you never worry about like the competition per se, right? You're just thinking about whether or not people will still keep buying your product. Right. So I think that's, if, if 2021, if there's a quote unquote fear, it's probably just like how the market is going to react. I think when we went into the pandemic, we were all super nervous that there wasn't going to be a lot of purchasing power, right? But that has shown not to be the case because the markets are just increasing like crazy. So I think one, one thing that I don't think it's just founders, but all of us in the back of our mind is thinking like, what, how, when does this bull market actually crash? We don't know. And maybe it doesn't, but that's something that we're thinking about. How do you make sure, like in the best portfolio companies you have, like, you know, like the Mannies of the world, where it's gone from group talent to outreach, which is a unicorn. How do they make sure everyone on the team is aligned with a broader company vision, right? Like how to train, how do you, how do they, I guess, what have you seen that do well, one or two things uh, that trains the organization to make better decisions when they're not in the room? Like the, when the leaders are not in the room. Um, I think, um, and I, I can't really speak to outreach because we haven't, we haven't seen outreach in a long, long time in terms of like their day to day. Um, but I think at, at some point as a founder, you have to figure out how to scale yourself. Right. And the, and that's when you surround yourself with senior management, right. That you trust. And so your goal now, instead of having, 13 or 15 meetings a day with like every single IC, you're now going to have a sync with maybe like two, three, four of the senior management that you put into place, right? So I think to train the organization to make better decisions or to stay on track, like you need to have a constant flow of communication, have frequent meetings with the senior management, set good KPIs for, for whatever organization or, or group that they manage and make sure that you keep communicating what your values are so that the people like the ICs can make decisions based on those values, right? I think the, 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 when people go or when companies veer off course, it's because we don't have a good set 
of guidelines in which to make decisions based off of. When is the right time to raise? Like, you know, when should a founder start planning and prepare and like, how should they think of timing? Like from yeah. sort of C through B. Yeah, I think, you know, you always, if you have the luxury, you always want to raise from a position of strength if you can, right? So if you have subtraction and growth and the macro tailwinds are all in your favor, then it's not a bad time to raise, right? Um, and typically people think about the like kind of the extra fire on fuel under the fire is when you have like six to eight months of runway left. Right. Um, but you know, other things to think about, um, in terms of timing, they're probably slower months in the year, like between Christmas and new year. But for the most part, I think VCs are always working and they're always hungry to, to learn more. The process might be a little bit slower during the holiday. I mean, sorry, during the summer, but doesn't mean that they're not active. Um, so, you know, I, I think, when is the right time to raise really is dependent on every company. But if you have traction and the tailwinds are in your favor, that's an excellent story that you can tell. From all the companies you've invested in, you guys come in super early. Do you guys go in at the pre-seed stage too? Or Yeah, we, we've been going earlier and earlier um, because I just think, I, I think for us, um, and we talked a little bit about this with, with the, the bullish market, um, we're starting to see investors at the Series A level start to invest in seed, right? And competing with them when they're a little bit less price sensitive than us because we want, we're targeting a particular ownership uh, makes it difficult to compete. So we go a little bit earlier. But I actually, you know, for us, that hasn't been a cha big change in, um, in, in work mode for us. Um, you know, I do have a background in data science, but rarely do I make decisions based on data because at the early stage, we just don't have enough, right? Or it's not fair to draw conclusions from such a small data set. And having said that, I think that our strengths still evaluating founder quality and that doesn't change whether you're pre-seed or seed. I think you'll have data, data, uh, extra data to show their execution, but at this end of the day, it's really about the founder, right? And we saw that with the stories of pivoting and why that's important. Definitely. And then that tells me all the more that relationships are all the more important, right? Like life and business is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And, uh, and you know, how do you treat, how do you build those relationships with investors? What are some ways, some seeds you can plant in people right like now? Like before, before you raise. Yeah. Before you yeah. raise. Yeah. At the bare minimum, right. You can, you can, you want to create mind share in their, you know, because they're super busy. So at the very least, if you've talked to them, let's say before you can add them to a, your kind of like mailing list, right? Pro that gives updates on product or whatever. And so when every time you get in these, these investors get an email about you, it'll, it might prompt them to reach out or at least you'll be top of mind, right? Um, for those who actually have an additional interest in you, because sometimes you, like if you're lucky, you investors see or your pre-seed uh, pre investment and someone comes proactively and says, hey, I see you raised from version one, like uh, for your seed, I wanna be there for your series A. And you say like, oh, right now I don't need capital, but there are ways in which you can help. You can engage those investors that way. You get to know them, how helpful they are, et cetera. So there's different ways you can build relationships based on, based on what you need. And, and I think that's the best way to come at this, right? Like I think, the best partnerships are those that are super equal, right? Don't put investors on a pedestal. Ask us for help. And, and the best help that we can provide is actually in our network, right? Definitely. Opening, opening that up to you. And, and uh, it's a form of outreach too. Again, that's also sales, right? And I keep plugging outreach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. You're, you're selling, right? And, and actually it gives, it actually gives investors some confidence, right? If they believe in your product um, or, or you, even if it's super early, they can, they would push it to their own portfolio. They feel like it's worthwhile exploring, right? Or you can get a sense of like, are they, are these investors just kind of digging for information about me, right? If they don't champion what you're building forward. Awesome. Here, there's a question. What's your sweet spot for valuations you're seeing for pre-seed, seed, seed yeah. and series A right now? Yeah, uh, valuations for pre-seed, oh, they, they can be anywhere between, I mean, four million is on the low end, all the way up to 10, which is, doesn't even seem like seed, and then um, pre-seed. 
And then seed is anywhere between, I'd say like eight to even 20, right? And then series A is probably between like 20 to 50. 20 to 50. That is not my sweet spot, but that's just like the range that we're seeing in the market roughly. What's your sweet spot? My sweet spot, I, I think of it more as a, I can put into a, I can put about 500,000 to a million dollars of money to work in, in an initial deal. And I want to have anywhere between seven to 10%, right? So that could mean a, a variety of things, right? So um, if I write a million dollar check, I probably would be happy to do it at an eight post as an example, right? Or 500 at a, even at an eight post. So like, it, it really just depends. I think we are lucky that we have that flexibility, but we're targeting ownership um, based and, and with, with the flexibility of writing a check between 500,000 to a million. We're getting close to the top of the hour. So let's take a few of this, uh, these in, in rapid fire style. So boards, ideal style, uh, size and ideal background of the members, let's say at like C and series A. Yeah, I'd say probably five, right? So let's say the founders you have on board, one investor. Uh, so you probably, if you have two founders, that's two founders plus another three, right? One of them should be an independent. One will be a, probably your series A fund or a series A fund and one will be like your seed fund. Okay. And then yeah. in terms of independence, how do you recommend people find like that background? What are, what are you know, because there, you can look for the sizzle. Oh, I have the celebrity. Uh, independent board member, but what are, yeah. what are, what should startups really look for? I look for, uh, we always suggest a, a strong operator with very deep industry knowledge, right? So not, not an investor. Um, so as an example, we have one of our healthcare companies has, you know, one of the, one of the executives of Blue Cross Blue Shield, right? Um, and, and they're not going to know the nitty gritty detail of the, the way we think about, you know, metrics, et cetera, but they're going to think about, well, who should we talk to? What are the regulatory things that, uh, that, you know, VCs without that domain knowledge won't know. And then what is the best way to leverage your board members? Like, uh, you know, uh, how do you help your board, your, your, sorry, your founders? Yeah. I mean, I think there's three ways that's not even necessarily board, but just investors in general, right? Like the, the lowest hanging fruit is obviously they just give you capital, right? The second is that they're sounding boards for you, right? They have a wealth of knowledge and just based on the experiences that they've seen through, through other companies, you just want to hope, you just want to make sure that the investors you work with are not prescriptive. They're more asking you the right questions to arrive at the, the answer that you probably know is better for you. So as an example, when a company comes to me with a particular issue, I never say like, you should do A, B, or C. I ask the right questions to help them arrive to A, B, or C. Unless there's like something that's very red flaggy, right? Uh, catastrophic failure, then I'll say, don't do that. Um, and then the last piece on leveraging your investor base is, uh, is the network, right? The introductions to customers, um, introductions to future investors who might unlock more capital down the road. And of course, like just building, building your talent, your, your team. And then um, what, what percentage of, of that, I guess, like depends on where the founders are. They're super well networked. You're not helping them with recruiting, uh, but definitely fundraising. Do you, have, you, have you been in situations where you were asked for like client referrals and whatnot? It's not always possible, but. All the time. I, I don't even, I think the best boards are those that are just even proactive, right? And say like, and are constantly figuring out ways to sell your company. So every, you know, every, and when I look at our calendars, um, there's a part of our, our schedule where we're talking to operators at bigger companies, um, trying to figure out what their strategy is. And then we kind of pitch our companies and our portfolios that might fit in terms of customers or potential acquisitions in the future. So, yeah. so definitely the great investors are always thinking about how to bring you, you know, or, or bring more business to you and think about the future. Some examples of like unproductive, like sort of board noise distraction, right? Like if you feel comfortable sharing. Like oh, yeah. I was thinking about this because right now I'm going through a big problem. But I, I, I will say that um, for those of you who want to read some like kind of sensational stuff, right? Um, almost like tabloid stuff. Uh, you should look at Ryan Caldbeck's 
post when he left uh, Circle Up as CEO and founder. He has some serious stories about poor board behavior. Um, but the one that I'm dealing with right now is um, I'm not on the board of this company. Um, the company just raised a Series A female founder who's having a very hard time with her co-founder. And the co-founder and the board member are like very, very close, almost bro-like. And so she's trying to figure out where her co-founder now fits in this organization. He has many ideas of where he should be. She doesn't think that he's a good fit, et cetera. So they're, they're at an impasse. And so she decided to go to the board, the, the board uh, member and just preface and say like, I need help in thinking about this. And he completely dismissed her and called her emotional. Oh. And, and, and then went on to say, um, maybe you're not the right CEO and all this kind of stuff. It was just like very unprofessional. And I think like the things that he would, the wording, the words that he had used to talk to her, he would never use with a male. And she was being proactive. She wasn't being emotional. She reached out to him and said, I, I'm anticipating that we're going to have this issue. So I want to talk to you about it. And he called her emotional. So there's like little things like that where, you know, thankfully I don't see too many terrible behaviors, but sometimes you just, you know, you bite your tongue when people are still trying to figure out the nuances of working together. <laughs> but th these kinds of conversations are not productive. And I think like everyone should nip it in the butt and discuss it from the onset, right? And should not be afraid of replacing board members if possible, right? And yeah. And so, so, so then this, this founder called me and she said, like, I don't even know if I want to have, the, like, we just raised a series A. Can I give this money back? Like we're at that point. Last question here, book recommendations, not a lot, just one or two that you Yeah, yeah. Um, the two books that are on my, I haven't read these yet, but they're on my um, list and it's, they're books that I sent to our founders for, for the holidays. The first one's called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. World. So I talked a lot about like Swiss Army Knives and stuff. That's by David Epstein. Mm -hmm. And then another one called Thinking in Bets. Um, and that's by Annie Duke. And the premise of this book is how do you make decisions when you don't have all the information at hand? So range and thinking in bets. Awesome. This was fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Happy New Year. I need some traction.